Hey there, my name is Salandrak and welcome to part 3 and the conclusion of my comprehensive beginner's guide to RimWorld. In the first episode we covered new game settings, talked about the AI storytellers, and learned how to pick a decent starting team of pawns. And last time we focused on planning out the base and covered mood, drugs, storage, crafting, and a few other topics. In this session we'll be putting it all into practice, set up worker priorities, demonstrate new world gameplay, and cover all sorts of additional mechanics and concepts including combat. As always, chapter links are down in the description so you can quickly find any information you might be looking for, and the description also has links to some great guides for further study by some other content creators. If you've been enjoying these guides, be sure to smack that like button, feel free to subscribe, and let me know down in the comments if there are any other RimWorld topics you would like me to make guides about. Now let's get to it! Our base has been all planned out and we're just about ready to unpause the game, but first there are a few more details to take care of, starting with setting up our worker priorities. Accessed by clicking the work button at the bottom of the screen or pressing the F1 key, by default, the game will use a basic priority scheme where pawns that are somewhat decent at a job will be given a green check mark, and when deciding what to do, they'll simply go from left to right, doing any jobs that need to be done. Early on, when there aren't many tasks queued up, this might work fairly well, but as you get more pawns, using this simplified priority system will lead to all sorts of really important stuff never getting done in a timely manner, if at all. So instead, I highly recommend that you immediately switch to manual priorities and get them set up before you unpause the game. And you'll need to reevaluate the priorities anytime a new pawn is added or you notice that key jobs are not getting done. As with the basic system, pawns will still go from left to right, but they'll start with anything set at a 1 priority, go left to right, then go to number 2 from left to right, and so on and so forth. Using this system you can ensure that your best workers will always prioritize what you want them to focus on, and they will only move on to lower priority items if their top tier jobs are all complete. The leftmost tasks from firefight to basic should generally always be set to 1 for everyone, though you'll usually only want your best doctors set to 1 for that job, as the last thing you need is a low skilled quack performing surgery. The Hall Plus category on my list comes courtesy of the Allow Tool mod, which adds a number of helpful tools under the Architect Orders category, including the ability to instruct your colonists to basically drop what they're doing and move stuff to a stockpile, something you'll need to do on a regular basis, such as when perishable materials randomly land on the map. Without this mod, you would basically need to adjust people's haul priority anytime that lots of stuff needs to get moved quickly, or manually instruct them to go out and haul, which is rather obnoxious. Note that you can raise or lower the priority level for all colonists by holding shift and left or right clicking in the job category. Once you've set the leftmost priorities to 1 for pretty much everyone, except maybe your not top doctors or maybe slow pokes that you don't want trekking across the map to urgently haul stuff, I'll then set up each colonist with their primary jobs at a number 2 priority and let lower skill pawns keep maybe a 3 or 4 so they can still be instructed to do that job type if necessary, but will otherwise only get to it if their other jobs are complete. And for any pawns that are truly terrible at something, feel free to leave the box empty, which will prevent them from engaging in that activity even if you try to tell them to do it. You can sort the characters by skill level by clicking the name of the job category, and hovering over any box will give a pop-up showing the skill of the worker for that line, and for job categories, a description of what all is included in that job type. Finally, whether or not a pawn is interested in or passionate about a skill is indicated by the faint fire symbols in the bottom right corner of each box. In this case, I'll set Trumpet at a 2 for Social, and for now set Morgan at 3 and NG at 4. For Handle, which involves taming, training, and taking care of animals, I'll put Morgan and NG at 4 and leave Trumpet blank. Since none of these guys are very good or interested in animals, I'll probably ignore such tasks until I get someone more skilled or that at least has an interest or passion. If I had a more useful starting pet like a husky or timber wolf, I would have someone set higher, but since my Yorkshire Terrier isn't going to do much for me, I'll probably just ignore him. For Cook, I'm actually going to set Morgan, my least terrible cook, at a 2. 
She's actually not going to do any cooking though unless absolutely necessary, but this job includes butchering animals that my hunters will bring to the eventual freezer. For hunting, I'll set both NG and Trumpet at 2, which will trigger them to head off hunting any time I mark an animal to be hunted. Those two will also get construction set to 2, while Morgan will be blank for both these job types as she's absolutely terrible at both. Morgan and Trumpet will get 2s for the grow category, and I'll put NG at a 4 so she can help plant crops if needed, though I might set it to blank when it's time to harvest. NG and Trumpet will get 3s for mining, which they'll end up doing between construction jobs and plant cut will get the same settings as grow. Smith and Taylor are crafting jobs related to making weapons, armor, and clothing, and NG will get a 1 priority for these jobs. Since I will manually control when such jobs need to get done using the related crafting bills, I'll only set them when I really need something made, so it gets a higher priority than NG's other normal top jobs of construction and hunting. Training is a job category added by the Miscellaneous Training mod, which allows you to build archery targets and training dummies for both shooting and melee combat skills, all of which can be used by pawns for entertainment as well as working on their skills outside of combat, though it's pretty slow for leveling up. Later on I might set a dedicated soldier to have a high priority for this job, but for now I'll just set everyone to 4. Trumpet is the only one I'll allow to do art, but as that isn't a priority right now, I'll just set it to a 4, and will change it to a 1 if I really wanted to do something artistic. Craft, on the other hand, is basically making homogenous goods that don't get a quality modifier when made, and I'm actually going to set Morgan and Angie to 2 on this. Early on, this job will mostly be making bricks out of stone chunks, which will be used for construction projects. Unfortunately, making those bricks is actually too mundane to increase your crafting skill. General hauling and cleaning aren't high priorities with this small of a colony and will stay at 3 for everyone, but if rooms start to get really dirty, I might bump someone up to a 1 or 2 temporarily to get things cleaned up. I'll also have to manually instruct people to refuel things like wood generators, as they otherwise won't get to it if they're busy with higher priority jobs. Later on I'll want to have dedicated haulers and cleaners that have these jobs as their highest non-urgent priorities, and for research I'll set Morgan to 2 so she'll spend her time doing research whenever she isn't needed for gardening, butchering, or making bricks. And that's it for manual priorities. And again, it's a good idea to reevaluate this screen anytime you acquire a new colonist or anytime you notice that key jobs are getting neglected. As for the schedule page, you usually don't have to tweak this too much, but if you get a night owl, be sure to adjust their schedule accordingly. You also might need to add specific recreation times for grumpy butts to make sure they have good downtime, or even stagger recreation times of social enemies to minimize the time they might otherwise end up hanging out with each other. But overall, I don't find the schedule page to be nearly as impactful or important as the work priority screen. The Assign page though does come in handy, especially later on when you've got dedicated soldiers or need to manage moods and drug needs. In the early game, I'll generally leave clothing at its default setting of anything, but once I start making dusters, cowboy hats, and button-down shirts, I'll set pawns on a worker assignment that I'll adjust to have only those options as well as probably a flak vest. More on that later on. I like to change everyone to herbal medicine unless they get really sick, in which case I'll change it to best quality. Drug policy I usually set to no drugs unless special needs situations arise. Even set to no drugs though, you'll still be able to instruct pawns to take something as needed, such as to improve a bad mood or help an exhausted pawn fight in a midnight raid. On the far right, you can set pawns to always carry certain amounts of medicine with them, which is a good idea for your doctors just in case a critical wound needs to get patched before moving someone to a hospital bed. The last thing we need to do before unpausing the game is set up a stockpile area and a dumping stockpile, as the first job I want everyone to do is gather up all the stuff that crashed with them. I've decided to place an initial temporary stockpile in the future dining room area, where I'll also build a temporary barracks within the plan lines using wood, so that later I can build the permanent walls using stone and then deconstruct the wood ones. It's important to get things like medicine, components, and packaged survival meals stored indoors as soon as possible, otherwise they will start to deteriorate. I'll move them out a bit later once I've got a temporary stockpile room set up where the permanent one will be built. For a dumping zone, this can just go below the future workshop. 
Stockpile gets made, and to cause everyone to start hauling all the stuff to the stockpile, I simply right-click on the Allow tool and select Unforbid All Items. Now at long last we unpause the game and watch our pawns get to work. They immediately set off to haul everything to the stockpile as there are not any other jobs lined up yet, and pretty fast it's filled up and doesn't have room for anything else. Since steel doesn't need to be stored indoors, I simply remove it from the stockpile and add it to the dumping stockpile, then instruct them to urgently haul all the steel to the other location. Once they've finished hauling all the supplies to the stockpile room, I do a quick sweep of the map to make sure nothing got missed, then I pause the game again and start queuing up some more jobs, starting with instructing each pawn to pick up a weapon. As my best and most passionate shooter, Angie gets the bolt action rifle, which is a good hunting weapon. Trumpet gets the revolver, and my not so skilled but has the brawler trait Morgan gets the knife. Looks like Trumpet already grabbed the flak vest, while Morgan already grabbed the helmet and pants. That's probably fine for now, but in a raid situation, I would probably put the armor on a frontline melee character which in this case would probably be Trumpet because Engie is such a good shooter, and I would want Dr. Morgan to avoid getting hurt. Now it's time to put them to work with construction jobs for my builders and growing jobs for my gardeners. First I'll place the walls and a few doors for the temporary barracks within the area of the future dining room, and I'll go ahead and place three beds for them to sleep in. If it gets to nighttime and the room is finished but they haven't quite built the beds, then I'll at least place some sleeping spots to get them to sleep indoors. Next I'll drop a growing zone on the fertile soil and set it so rice will get planted. In general, you only ever want to use potatoes on maps that have lots of stony soil and little regular or fertile soil. As between the other crops, strawberries don't produce as much and only have the benefit of being edible raw. Rice is usually the best crop to grow early on, as it has a pretty short growing cycle and will quickly get food into the freezer. Corn on the other hand takes longer to grow but has higher yield per harvest. Overall it tends to produce about the same amount of food as rice, but is a bit less labor intensive. However, that longer grow time means it's also more susceptible to bad things that can happen that might ruin the crop, such as weather events, blight, or the end of the growing season. Later on I might start to do some mixed crops once the colony is more established, but for now I'll just stick with rice. Since I have a decently skilled gardener, I'll also plant a small patch of heel root, and a small patch of smoke leaf, and a medium sized patch of cotton plants, which will be needed for a variety of crafting and furniture items. If you don't have a skilled gardener, it's a good idea to periodically check the growth of nearby wild heel root plants, as well as berry bushes, and select them for harvest once they're fully grown. As my builders get to work building the initial barracks room, I keep an eye on how much wood I have, and as it starts to run low, I select fully grown trees nearby to get chopped. By the end of the first day they've managed to complete the barracks room and built the beds, and I add a sleeping spot for Caviar, the pet Yorkshire Terrier. All of the cotton got planted, as well as a few rice, but tomorrow the rest of the crops will get done while I get their temporary freezer set up, and build a wood generator to fuel the nutrient paste dispenser and the freezer's coolers. To ensure that they have a form of entertainment, I also place a horseshoe pin. A table and three chairs get placed in the barracks, and then I build the paste dispenser inside the freezer. It's a bit cramped, but I'll build out the full setup as soon as possible once I get enough bricks to do so. By the end of the second day they've just about finished up all the queued projects, but I manually tell Trumpet to finish the last few sections of freezer walls before letting him go to sleep. The next morning I remember to actually drop the temperature of the freezer, and then I make a temporary butcher closet within the lines of the long term freezer. A few ibex get marked for hunting to get some raw meat for the paste dispenser, and then I select all wild heel root in the area to get harvested. A butcher creature bill gets set up at the butcher table set to do forever and take to best stockpile. This way meats will move to the freezer and leather will get moved into storage. Now something you'll want to keep an eye on throughout the game is pawns leaving stuff lying around that really needs to go into storage as soon as possible. Good examples include harvested plants, including crops as well as wild berries and heel root, as well as components that can be mined from brownish looking compacted machinery. For whatever reason, whenever stuff is mined or harvested, 
pawns will frequently just leave it sitting there unless or until the priority system tells them or someone else to haul it. So if you see stuff getting left behind, or basically anytime you know a colonist is out harvesting or mining components, it's a good idea to manually tell them to haul it home with them. If you see someone out harvesting, say, wild heel root, you can also manually instruct them to harvest a plant, then instruct them to haul the herbal medicine, then harvest the next plant, then haul, etc, etc. Alternatively, you can hold shift click to send them out to harvest specific plants, and when done, you shift click to go back and haul everything home. Now that the basic necessities of food and meal production, as well as storage and lodging are set up, my next priority is to establish a larger stockpile area and a basic crafting and research room. As with my temporary barracks and freezer, these will be built using wood within the plan lines of the long-term locations, allowing me to build the final structure with stone once I've got enough bricks crafted. Once these rooms are built, I place a research bench and a stone cutter's table, and just after they're finished, I get my first attack, a mad hare. That rabbit's got a vicious street a mile wide, it's a killer! Raids will automatically pause the game, and hovering over the notification envelope will put an arrow on screen pointing to the threat. This little guy is actually pretty close to my base, so I select all my colonists, press R to draft them into combat service, and then right click and drag to position them where they'll hopefully have good lines of sight to shoot the bunny. Since Morgan is so far away and not the best fighter, I just undraft her, as NG and Trumpet should be more than able to take out a single rabbit. They automatically start shooting at the threat once it's close enough, and manage to down it before it gets in melee range. Threat neutralized! The first few combat events generally aren't too hard to handle, but we'll talk more about combat tactics, including cover, friendly fire, and base security a bit later. Getting back to work, I set up a bill at the stonecutter's table to make marble bricks, and set it to do until I have 200 in storage. A ton of bricks are going to be needed to build the base, but you don't ever want to have too many on hand at once, as the bricks increase the colony's wealth more than the resulting structures. So using this method, I can basically alternate between making the bricks and making the structures, and gradually build up the base. I also go ahead and set up my first research task, and choose batteries as it will allow me to use solar and wind power. There are a lot of strategies on what to prioritize when it comes to research, but my general approach is to first address critical infrastructure needs, and otherwise focus on defense, meaning weapons and armor. A common new player trap is to instead focus on making your pawns comfortable and building your base, but doing so will increase your wealth, which will result in stronger raids attacking you. And if you don't have the means to protect yourself, you can kiss all those comforts and maybe even your pawns goodbye. Eventually, I get a notification that Angie thinks it's time to give themselves faction and town names, and given I've got two 50-year-old single ladies decide to call the faction, with the assistance of the randomized button, the Pan-Galactic Confederacy of Cougars, and the town Cougarville. From here on out, the rest of the game is basically a process of gradually building up the base, acquiring more pawns, and researching technologies, so let's shift gears away from progressive gameplay and start talking about all the things you'll need to know about combat. Doing well in combat is mandatory for the survival of your colony. Not only does successful combat provide all sorts of resources, like weapons, potential recruits, and salvageable materials, but you also need to do well so that your people don't all die or get kidnapped into slavery. So here's some of the basics that might not be so obvious when you start learning the game. First things first, you need to understand how friendly fire works. Now, this isn't a scientifically precise, in-depth, hardcore optimized mechanics overview, but it will give you a rule of thumb that should help you to not accidentally murder your own pawns with ranged weapons. The general rule is this. Whenever you have a pawn using a ranged, non-explosive weapon, so guns and bows, but not grenades or rocket launchers, if there is a friendly pawn somewhere in the line of fire and the friendly pawn is more than about five tiles away from the shooter in a perfectly straight line, then there is a chance to accidentally hit the friendly pawn. However, so long as the friendly pawn is close enough to the shooter, then there is no chance to hit the friendly, even if the target is also within that safe zone. 
Here's the specific shape of where pawns can safely be from the perspective of a single shooter in the middle. Now, because you will generally have multiple shooters and multiple targets scattered all over the place, here's another rule of thumb if, for example, you want to have your pawns clumped together so that everyone can safely shoot without any risk of hitting your own pawns. And it's simply this. Make sure all your pawns fit within an area that is 3x5 tiles horizontally and 3x5 tiles vertically. So long as all your pawns fit within that area, everyone should be safe from friendly fire. Note that this rule also applies to friendly gun turrets within that area. Knowing this general rule is very helpful for dealing with insect infestations and manhunter animal packs, as you can line up three well-armored melee pawns on the front line in a three-tile wide hallway or choke point, and then put four rows of pawns behind them that can unload with ranged weapons. Just don't put anyone on the front line in a doorway, as for some reason that is a bit of an exception to the friendly fire rules. Also be careful using this type of setup against enemies that might have explosives for obvious reasons. Now let's talk about armor as it is critical for minimizing the risk of pawns suffering debilitating injuries or even sudden death when fighting. There are three types of armor protection in the game, sharp, blunt, and heat. Sharp is generally the most important armor type as it protects against projectiles like bullets and arrows as well as all sorts of cutting and stabbing weapons, while blunt protects against fists and clubs and the like, and heat protects against being set on fire. Without getting into the weeds of the numbers and calculations, the important thing to understand is that in combat, pawns are more likely to get hit in the larger body part areas, like torso and legs, than they are in the smaller areas like hands and heads. However, they're also more likely to suddenly die from getting hit in the torso, neck, or head, so you absolutely want to make sure those areas are protected. In the early game, it's a good idea to research flak armor as soon as possible, and then make at least a flak vest for each of your pawns, whether combat-oriented or not. This piece of armor provides excellent protection for the torso, neck, and shoulders, and because it occupies the middle clothing area, it can be worn on top of a shirt and underneath a coat such as a duster. And speaking of dusters, this is a fantastic piece of gear to put on all of your pawns, as depending on what material it is made from, it can provide really good protection against hot temperatures and is decent for cold weather, as well as good armor protection for the whole body except for the head. Add in a button-down shirt, pants, and a helmet of some sort, and your pawns will be pretty well protected. Materials-wise, the various wools and furs generally provide the best protection against both hot and cold temperatures and decent armor values. But if you want to maximize the armor perks of your clothing items, then you'll want to start growing Devil Strand as soon as possible and use it for your base layers and dusters. It's not quite as good as Thrumbo Fur or Hyperweave, but it is far more accessible. Just be aware that Devil Strand has a very long grow time, and if you aren't on a tile with a year-round growing season, it will probably need to be cultivated in a greenhouse. Getting back to flak armor, it's really not worth it to make either the flak jacket or flak pants. The pants aren't too bad if you are in a mild climate area, but the flak jacket is actually worse than a Devil Strand duster in every category except protection against cold weather where it's only a few degrees warmer. So to summarize, to do a good job of protecting your pawns, try to outfit everyone with a flak vest, make sure you have helmets on hand for combat, and if you can get it grown, go with devil strand dusters, button down shirts, and pants, and the chances of your pawns getting killed in combat will go down substantially. The next combat topic you need to understand is cover. There are all sorts of things that can provide cover against ranged attacks, including bushes, trees, stone chunks, and of course defensive structures like sandbags and barricades. However, you will only receive the benefit of cover if you are standing directly next to the structure. Move one tile away and the cover goes away entirely. Standing behind a wall corner is actually the best cover you can get, though it can limit the range of targets you can hit as the wall starts to get in the way though the angles you can use to hit targets will be a bit wider than the angles enemies can use to hit you. With all forms of cover, the amount of protection it gives is maximized when the cover is directly between the shooter and the target, and starts to go down as the shooter moves off to the side. 
But if you have adjacent forms of cover, such as a line of barricades or a barricade next to a wall, then as the shooter's ankle moves off to the side, it is possible to get a mix of cover protection from both structures that intersect the line of fire. So with all that in mind, the key takeaway is that when in ranged combat, always stand right next to something that provides cover for your pawns whenever possible, as even a tree or a bush will help reduce the probability of getting hit. And whenever possible, set up your defensive positions such that your pawns will be protected by cover, but your targets won't be. Which brings us to our next topic, base security. Now, this is a topic that a lot of RimWorld players have pretty strong feelings about, as some of the options may be extremely efficient, but can also be kind of cheesy. But unless you're playing on the peaceful difficulty level, you are going to have to defend your base against all sorts of different types of attacks, so it's important to know what some of the options are for dealing with these dangers. Depending on how your base is situated within natural features, you're going to need to be able to defend your base from attacks coming from multiple directions. A perimeter wall is great for keeping packs of manhunter animals out, and a kill box will funnel them and early game raids into an area of your choosing. Automated turrets can be added to increase your overall firepower and distract enemies from your pawns, and walls and barricades can be built to give your pawns maximum cover from ranged attacks. To ensure that enemies will be in range of your guns and not camp the entrance, sandbags can be used to force them in, as enemies will be unable to stop and stand on the bags. Add a bunch of traps or IEDs to the area leading to the entrance, and you'll likely soften up the enemy before it even has a chance to start attacking. Now some players like to build long winding paths leading into the kill box, but I've always found this to be a bit too far on the cheesy side of the spectrum for my personal taste. However, on higher difficulties, methods like this may be more or less necessary to survive. Since the enemy does not play fair on these settings, you probably shouldn't either. A counterpoint though, is that later on in the game raiders will frequently avoid your kill box entirely, as sapper and breacher raids will bust through the walls somewhere else, and drop pod raids will literally fall straight into the middle of your base. For raids that start at the edge of the map, you can always soften them up with mortars or other long range weapons, such as sniper rifles, but you'll probably want to set up other defensive areas separate from the kill box. Turrets covering the walls may help to steer sapper raids to specific weak points, but breacher raids are far less predictable, and for raids that drop right on top of you, be prepared to move from room to room, finding whatever cover you can to hopefully focus fire your enemies down. So all things considered, the key to survival, particularly towards the end of the game, is to have flexibility. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, make sure there are cover options all around your base, and prioritize good armor for all of your pawns. Last topic in the category of combat is weapons, which I'll keep brief. The main point you need to know is that quality makes a huge difference in weapon effectiveness and generally speaking, a higher quality weapon of a type that's generally not considered very good is still going to be better than a lower quality weapon of a type considered superior. In the very early game, you're mostly stuck with whatever you can pick up from raiders or craft easily, but even pretty low tech weapons like clubs and the various bows can be pretty effective. For melee weapons, you'll generally want to use blunt weapons, like clubs and maces, if you want to maximize your chances of downing but not maiming your foes for recruitment potential. Blunt weapons also work well against mechanoids, as their armor is weakest to this type of damage. If you want to kill your human foes though, weapons like the gladius, longsword, or spear work really well. For ranged weapons, the recurve and great bows are decent low tech options. Once you've got gunsmithing, the bolt action rifle is a good hunter and long range weapon, while the pump shotgun is decent for close quarters fights. But once you've got gas operation and precision rifling, you'll generally want to put heavy SMGs in the hands of your low skilled shooters and assault rifles in the hands of your marksman pawns, upgrading to charge rifles later on if you are so inclined. Miniguns can also be used to good effect by your low skilled shooters, but they're just really expensive to make. And the final topic and last subject we'll cover in the guide is wealth management. The overall value of your colony is the primary factor that determines how mean your storyteller can be 
when it decides to throw a major event at you like a raid. You can see your colony's wealth by hitting the book icon at the bottom of the screen, which shows a graph over time and recent major events. In general, the vast majority of everything you have in your base, as well as any mined resources, will add to your colony's wealth. This includes the value of your pawns themselves, which is itself based primarily on their skills and health conditions, if any. For a detailed overview of what does and doesn't count towards your wealth and how to deal with it, check out an excellent guide put together by Adam vs. Everything, link down in the description. He's also great to watch if you want to see extreme difficulty no pause commitment mode gameplay. Because colony wealth directly correlates to how hard raids can be, it's important to always focus first on your ability to protect your wealth before you start acquiring too much of it. If at any point you are finding that enemy raids are seeming a bit hard, you may want to look at ways to decrease your wealth, increase your defensive capabilities, or both. So how do you manage your wealth? Well, there are several methods depending on what is pushing your wealth up. One easy way to keep your wealth down is to simply make sure you never stockpile too much of anything in particular, whether it's food, steel, weapons, or even wood. So if stocks are getting high, stop acquiring more of that type of item so you can use up what you have. You can also offload lots of stuff to trade caravans or send out caravans of your own. And if you still have too much stuff, consider gifting it to non-hostile factions, which will generally reward you with increased faction standing. Because at the end of the day, having a bunch of awesome stuff for your colonists to enjoy isn't such a good thing if it leads to them getting obliterated by an oversized raid that they aren't able to handle. So resist that urge to immediately mine everything on your map, stockpile huge amounts of food, and give your pawns every imaginable creature comfort, as doing so may just lead to the end of your game. But stick with the balanced approach to building your colony and providing comforts while focusing first on weapons and armor, and chances are you'll be able to handle whatever challenges your storyteller decides to throw at you. And that's it for the guides. Hopefully by now you're well armed with the knowledge and information you'll need to learn how to handle the game's challenges while not getting frustrated with its various quirks and features. As noted in the intro, if you've enjoyed these guides, please consider hitting that like button, say hello down in the comments, and maybe even consider subscribing. I also have a Discord server you're welcome to join, and I usually live stream a couple of times per week. Just check out the community page of my channel where I post my weekly schedule. Thanks for watching, and have fun out there out on the rim!